Okay, welcome everyone. Hello, thank you for joining our Brooklyn Tweed virtual coffee hour with John Crane. Thank you everyone and thank you so much to John for sharing your time with us today. We will be talking about wool, our favorite topic. Um, but before we begin, we have just a few things to go over just to set ourselves up. Uh, my name is Kel, my pronouns are she and her, and I am here with Allison, who is moderating the chat today. Thank you so much, Allison. Uh, we invite you all to include your pronouns in your display name if you choose. You can do this by clicking on the participants icon at the bottom of your Zoom window, or just click on your name and choose more and then rename. Uh, we want to ensure that Brooklyn Tweed events are accessible and welcoming to all participants. We do have closed captioning available for this session. If you can't see the captions, click on the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen. And if you have trouble with this or any other tech issues with the Zoom, just post a message in the chat and we will do our best to help you out. Thank you for helping us make this a welcoming event. We believe that knitting and crochet is for everyone, that all garments are for all bodies, and that craft should be a safe space for all. We acknowledge that here in Portland, Oregon, we are on the unceded lands of the Multnomah, Wasco, Cowlitz, Kathlamet, Clackamas, Bands of Chinook, Tualatin, Kalapulia, Malala, and other forcibly displaced peoples and that we live and work in a state historically barred to people of color. We recognize our privilege in being here today. And we are very happy to be here with you today. Um, for those who aren't familiar, at Brooklyn Tweed, we develop and make breed-specific wool yarns that help to support the American fiber supply chain and highlight the stories of our domestic manufacturing partners. We design, source, dye, and spin our yarns 100% within the USA and create knitting patterns that highlight the characteristics of each of our yarns. Um, and that is how we got to know Mr. John Crane. And I will turn the floor over to you, John, so that you can introduce yourself. Well, this, this is a real treat uh, to be here. Uh, I was, uh, uh, and, and it's been a real treat to get to know you all as friends and colleagues at Brooklyn Tweed because uh, our interests uh, align so much uh, in, in the field of fiber and sheep and yarn and all of that. Uh, and thought I might just give a brief uh, intro as to where uh, I think we all have different uh, paths in the fiber world. Uh, but I also want to say this. This was advertised as a coffee hour, so I hope you all have had your form of coffee. It's now 7 p.m. here on the East Coast, so my coffee has a little different form tonight, uh, but I uh, drink to you all, have our knitting, and, uh, and uh, invite you all to, to join in this group. And as you have questions or observations, please feel free to put them in the chat uh, uh, into the chat and we'll try to either answer questions or bring up interesting points on that. So, uh, you know, in, in, in thinking about uh, uh, this invitation to, uh, to join you all, I uh, uh, thought back to where, where did the interest in fiber, uh, fiber begin? And uh, when this event was announced, my, my high school uh, classmate Carolyn reminded me that it was she who taught me how to knit. Uh, and, and that was probably in chemistry lab in high school. Now, my, my memory of that is, is, is even beyond a little hazy. So, uh, but Carolyn has always had a much better memory than I. And so I take that as fact. Uh, and the next uh, point of reference that I can remember uh, was when uh, <clears throat> I think I was in college and my wonderful, wonderful great aunt Yvonne, who was my godmother and just a fabulous knitter, offered to knit me a sweater. And I actually uh, worked with her in finding a pattern and finding a yarn. And I recently found that sweater. 
uh, packed away in a box and it still has the scent of mothballs, uh, but it's now a very treasured object. As you'll see a little later uh, in our conversation that it really ties into a lot of knitting that I've been doing, but I really wanted to give credit to, to Aunt Yvonne uh, who sort of got this going. And uh, uh, then skip ahead actually several years uh, and uh, 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 I was, I, I think I was really lucky to actually uh, uh, grow up on a farm in rural Vermont where it teaches you sort of resiliency and creativity every day and a connection to land and to animals. Uh, in retrospect, I wish it had been a sheep farm. Uh, uh, in fact, Vermont was filled with merino sheep during the 19th century, but in the 20th century when I was living, uh, we actually had chickens and that wasn't going to be my future. <laughs> but uh, on to college, graduate school, life as an academic librarian, uh, all really rich and wonderful uh, experiences. Uh, as I'm starting to retire from librarianship and my retirement's been announced, colleagues start, you know, taking me out to lunch as they do and saying nice things. And I arrived at one of these lunches and my colleague Susan handed me yarn and needles and said, John, this is actually a knitting lesson. She said, you said you always wanted to learn to knit. Well, now's the time. And that <laughs> caught me by surprise. Uh, it wasn't in the plan. My plans for retirement was to be a printmaker. I was really interested in, in visual arts, in color, and, and printmaking had really taken uh, on a special place for me. And I already had a printmaking studio uh, and was proceeding down that, down that track. But the, the fiber and the knitting kind of snuck in the back door, courtesy of my friend, Susan. And if she's on tonight, I want to give a special wave to her. Uh, and, uh, uh, and that interest just grew. And in about five years, I realized that printmaking was a thing of the past and, and fiber making took over. So that's kind of the trajectory of that uh, 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 interest. And of course it started with, with knitting. Uh, and then for a while you sort of say, well, I'm knitting uh, with yarn, aren't I? I wonder how yarn is made. And so uh, the, next, the next step was spinning, of course, uh, because we were gonna find out how to make yarn. Uh, and so uh, th that interest uh, went for a while. And then I realized I had this wonderful fiber that was all processed and I was spending and where does that come from? And then uh, that led, to, well, uh, that led to purchasing my first fleece at, at the New York State Sheep and Wool Festival at Rhinebeck. And that was a thin fleece. It was a wonderful fleece to start with. Uh, and the next year I went to Rhinebeck, I bought three fleeces uh, and well, the whole project just grew. And uh, so that's kind of the story tell of in, 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 in general. And it's really uh, a thrill to be here now. <laughs> so clearly the next step is opening your own yarn company because that's pretty much how we got here. Um, yes, isn't it? <laughs> Yes, you, you pick up those needles and the next thing you know, you're, you're running your own carpet or yarn company or working for a yarn company. Um, so yes, definitely, definitely uh, similar experiences for a lot of our team. A lot of us started out doing very, very different things and then found that love of fiber that, that brought us all together. So... And sheep really are this marvelous animal. I mean, they've been with humans literally for thousands of years. Uh, and they offer us, uh, they offer us fiber for, for clothing. They offer us milk uh, and they offer us meat. And so they're, they're really a big part of humanity. And we as humans have really offered them protection. I mean, sheep in general uh, are, are very prone to predators. They have trouble finding water. Uh, and there's been this real relationship between, between sheep and humans for so long. And, uh, uh, and then, uh, of course, sheep are kind of worldwide in that case. And we, we, uh, uh, there's been so much to learn in that regard. 
So John, tell us how you started your wool library project, um, which we at Brooklyn Tweed are currently the very proud custodians of and hope to be able to show it to folks again in person in the future. Um, but tell us how that, how did that project all get started and, and tell us what, and tell us what that's about, because I'm sure a lot of people are not familiar with it since it's been a thing that you've been showing to people in person rather than. Right, rather than uh, via Zoom. Uh, why don't I give a, a brief overview of that and then tell, I think you have some samples we can actually show folks and get a, get yes. a feel for what that is. Uh, well, I think uh, it, it uh, partly, I think, was my librarian background where I, I like to to capture a field and understand it and to organize it uh, in ways that it can be presented to other people in a way that they can understand and sort of appreciate the beauty and the complexity uh, and the breadth of whatever it is. And so in this case, uh, you know, as I mentioned, I bought my first fleece uh, uh, at the New York State Sheep and Wool Festival uh, and, and learned how to wash it and to, well, uh, you know, pick out all the bad bits and wash it and card it uh, and then, uh, and then uh, spin it. And, 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 and I realized that, well, this is what this breed is like. And when I went back to Rhinebeck the next year, of course, they have a fabulous uh, uh, marketplace and all the fibers, uh, the fleeces are organized according to type. And I think I spent half the fair in that room searching and I limited myself to purchasing three more fleeces. And I can't quite remember what those are at this point. Uh, but the, 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 the interest just grew as I began to realize because uh, in fact, uh, with, with wonderful resources, uh, you know, like uh, Deb Robeson's uh, uh, and Carol uh, Carius's book, uh, Fleece and Fiber Bible, which is, just an immensely wonderful resource. Uh, and there's a reduced version of it, uh, the Field Guide to Fleece, which is wonderfully handy to carry. And of course, uh, uh, Clara Park's Book of Wool. Uh, these soon found their way into my library because uh, what these fleeces did was they pulled me into different parts of the world and you began to understand why different fleeces were the way they were depending on the climate and the needs of the people because individual shepherds shaped the uh, different uh, species. And uh, so it, it just started snowballing and uh, collecting more and more. Uh, I found a wonderful source on Facebook called Raw Fleeces for Sale. And this was, I think there were about 5,000 members worldwide on the site. And so it was this amazing candy store uh, of fleeces that, uh, uh, you could look through. And I think over a period of about three years, I ended up collecting about 70 different breeds of sheep this way. And uh, as uh, full fleeces, of course, are very, uh, a lot of work to clean and process. And I developed a relationship with the Ohio Valley uh, uh, processors. Uh, and I would, I would uh, save some locks from the fleece and then I'd send the fleece out to have it washed and carded and it returned to me as, uh, as carded uh, fiber. Uh, I would then spin it into yarn, uh, a hank of yarn, and then I'd also knit up a swatch uh, of fabric to get a feel for, for uh, what the fabric was going to be like. And this process just went on for about three years and I kept amazing how we could find these different fleeces. And that's, so that's sort of the, it, it was the snowball effect that happened uh, and then, the fun part was taking it around to various uh, fiber festivals uh, and, and watching. Uh, and I would guess at this point, probably 20,000 people have viewed this uh, because it was at, at small festivals and big ones. It was at Maryland Sheep and Wool Festival. Uh, and where it really, I really connected with you folks at Brooklyn Tweed was at the American Sheep Industry Association in New Orleans. And so it was just amazing how how individual people are touched by this as they are touching this fiber. So uh, maybe Kel, you can uh, take it and show some of what you've got there since the samples, uh, uh, the exhibit is now with you all in, in Portland. Yes, absolutely. Uh, so 
I have here some of our samples. Which are so yeah, I brought several different breeds with me from the library. I've got and what John has done for each of these is created these lovely display cards with photos of the breed. It has information on here. And then as he was saying, he's got for each breed the raw fleece right off the sheep and then the wool that he spun for each one and then a swatch knitted from the yarn that he prepared for each breed and this is it's amazing because he brought the whole thing to our offices at Brooklyn Tweed for us to see which was an amazing treat um and he's got breeds I've never heard of, breeds I had never been able to see in person, and you can touch them and read about them and feel the fabric and the yarn. And it's, it's really such a wonderful resource. And so we have this at our offices here in Portland now, and we're hoping that when you know, the pandemic is over and we can invite people back into our spaces again, that we can share this with folks because it's a really lovely, lovely resource. Um, and for people who are interested in fiber, it's really, really amazing to see. Um, and even for us and our, you know, our thing is breed specific wool. We learned more about the breeds that we work with. Um, and I do have a little slideshow that we can share in the chat if people are interested of the breeds that we use specifically for our yarns um, and how we've worked with them to make the most of, of each type of wool. Um, but yeah, it's so interesting to see the different types of wool from around the world based on where the sheep are living, the kind of terrain they're on. It's the coolest thing for fiber geeks like me. That really, uh, Kel, that was, uh, it, 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 the scope and extent of the project really did surprise me uh, as, as, as it took off. I mean, of course, this really represents the tip of the iceberg for uh, the number of sheep breeds in the world. Uh, there, there literally are hundreds. Uh, a, a, a breed is defined as as, as sh sheep that breed true. Uh, and, and so often that is a result of sort of geographic isolation. So for example, the island of Gotland off the east coast of Sweden has the sheep that have been there uh, from time immemorial. And, uh, and, uh, and so that is now the Gotland breed of sheep. And when Gotland's breed, you get Gotland. And so that is, that is a breed of sheep. Uh, and, and it is true kind of the world over as, as, as the world was geographically isolated in these pockets. And, uh, and so it was fascinating to get these, to, to zoom down into different parts of the world uh, in fact, in fact, there's in Florida, in the United States, for example, there are a couple of breeds of sheep that we have in this display, the Florida Cracker and the Gulf Coast Native. And we don't think of sheep in such a warm, humid climate. But in fact, the important thing for those, uh, those breeds is that their, their, their hooves are very rot resistant uh, and they, uh, 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 offer uh, particular kinds of thing. Uh, and uh, uh, that, that's another example of how different uh, breeds uh, uh, are appropriate to different parts of the world. And so we began to explore those and it just snowballed as the, as the project went forward. And, uh, and then after the, uh, the project was, uh, uh, was out in the world, of course, I was buying full fleeces and, uh, and I used only small portions of them uh, uh, for, the, uh, for the display itself. And I had <laughs> almost tons of fiber left over. 
So I worked with my friends at the Green Mountain Spinnery in Putney, Vermont, uh, and sort of arrived on their doorstep with all these fleeces, uh, in fact, all this carded roving that was sorted by breed. Uh, and we just had a heyday designing special yarns that would take advantage of each of the kinds of wool that we had. Uh, and uh, the, uh, 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 the display is divided, divided into five different types of fleeces. There's, there are fine wools, there are medium wools, uh, there are long wools and down wools and then heritage breeds. Uh, and so for each of those in California, I can get back to the bigger screen. I will show some of those uh, special yarns that we, we created uh, on that. Uh, the, starting with the fine wools, this really is a combination. We blended together the fleeces of Bond, uh, CVM, that's uh, California Variegated Mutant, what a terrible name, <laughs> Merino, Rambouillet, and Targhee. Uh, and we made a two-ply fingering weight yarn uh, that is just scrumptious. But it has all the bounce and the softness of the fine wools. And it's the kind of yarn you would make into a wonderful scarf or something very close to, uh, close to, uh, close to skin. And then uh, almost as nice, actually it's favored. We took a lot of the long wools these are the breeds that have long, silky fleeces uh, that don't have a lot of crimp. They have kind of curvy, wavy things. And so uh, it's almost silky uh, and beautiful, but it does have the scale so it holds together like yarn. Uh, and this is just a two-ply fingering weight uh, yarn also that will actually make wonderful uh, uh, lace, lace projects uh, for that. We took the heritage wools. These are the these are the, flea, the the breeds that have been around literally for hundreds of years, uh, and uh, many of them are uh, dual coated. That is, they have a tough outer coat that's very protective, and then often a very soft undercoat. It's really hardy, tough yarn, uh, and we made a, a sort of a, a an Aran weight three ply. Uh, this will make a great outerwear sweater that will uh, last for generations. Uh, it is spicy. And then, in some ways, one of the favorite yarns was the down wool blend. These are the breeds that are typically grown for meat, not for their fleeces, some for their milk. And it turns out that they have these wonderful, dense, blocky fleeces with very disorganized crimp, and they're full of air. And so what we did with this was to simply, it's a three ply yarn, but the individual plies were not twisted. Uh, they simply came off the carding machine and we twisted them together and it's just filled with bounce and air. So that was a really, really fun project that, that grew out of, out of this project. And, uh, and I'm really looking forward to the time when, when, when the uh, uh, display can get back on the road because the real thrill of this is is seeing people uh, excited by this. I'll never forget the first time it was on display. It was the uh, uh, Northeast Hand Spinners Association meeting in White River Junction, my hometown in Vermont. And about 10 minutes after it opened, a woman came up to me and she had tears streaming down her eyes and she was just totally moved by the touching of these fibers. And I think a lot of us are not surprised by that. I mean, it really is a, a, a deeply personal experience of touching these fibers and working with them and seeing and, and feeling the sheep. So yeah, so that's uh, that's the project. And with any luck, uh, we're gonna get, get the show back on the road. <clears throat> Absolutely. So, yeah. yeah. And for, for when I, the first time I saw the library, it was, it was really moving for me to read about particularly the heritage breeds, which, you know, in some cases have been around for thousands of years, um, are, are only raised in, you know, like one tiny little spot on the planet by, you know, yeah. one little group of farmers and they're still right. here. There's still people that are, that are looking after this one breed of sheep and keeping it going. And it's not right. just being blended into a big 
sort of commercial, right. you know, generic right. fine wool, white, yes. cheap yes. thing. Yeah, so right. that that was um, that was really moving for me. Allison has a great question um, mm. about what what defines something as a heritage breed as opposed to a long wool or a fine wool breed. You know, that's that of course is a very good question, and it's a very subjective. Uh, uh, there are very subjective answers to that. Uh, and, and the fleece and fiber Bible tends to make some, uh, 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 it's a way of organizing uh, fleeces uh, that, that, that kind of act and, and work in similar ways. Uh, in some senses, many of, of the long wolves are heritage breeds as well. It's kind of a catch-all category for ones that have been around for a long time. Uh, and uh, and so there really is nothing uh, sort of absolute about these 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 definitions. Uh, so that's uh, the, typically the heritage uh, breeds, as I said, often are dual coated. Uh, they 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 go way back. But for example, the Finn sheep, which is a very very old sheep, the Shetland sheep, they often have very fine uh, fine uh, uh, wool uh, with a very low micron count. And they make wonderful uh, 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 soft fibers. So I, I really encourage people not to be uh, put off by the fact that they might be a heritage breed, because that was what the exploration uh, showed uh, in, in this case. And what what have you got in your the packet there, uh, Kel? I brought the fin sheep because it's one of my favorite breeds. Um, they are they are frequently lovely little black sheep with lovely, lovely brown wool. Um, and yep. you, can, you can see the lovely crimp in those fibers there. Yeah, they're one of my favorites. Um, and I had never heard of them. And then I encountered them at a, at a festival. And uh, yeah, I'm always buying wool from, or yarn from various different breeds of sheep when I come across it uh, yeah. as well. So who knows? I might have my own wool library one day. I can you probably might. open my own yarn store from my stash. So yeah. <laughs> yes, you know, you, uh, I think people often say, "Well, which which breed uh, would you would I have based on this experience?" And fin sheep is really near the top of that. Uh, and I, I realized the things that I valued were it has a really fine wool, uh, which is which is fun and easy to spin, uh, and it, it's it's very fine. Uh, these these heritage breeds have been around so long they figured out birthing and taking care of themselves and so as a as a shepherd it's relatively easy to do these uh, and you know for and until this last year I had the pleasure of living on an old farmstead in Vermont for the last 40 years we had a hillside pasture we had a barn uh, and of course, you know, this progress of knitting and then spinning and then fiber and then sheep fibers, of course, the next step was sheep in the barn. And uh, uh, my husband, David, finally put his foot, <laughs> he, he was very practical about this. I mean, we knew that, but it was always kind of hanging out there. And would it be fin sheep? Uh, the other breed that I really liked was Clung Forest. Uh, you know, you pick those out, and uh, those are the steps that, that weren't taken. But uh, you know, that was uh, that was fun. Uh, shall we shall we shift over into sort of designing and the use of fibers in, in designing and uh, and the place of that Kel, or where? What do you think we should shift to next in our in our little conversation here? Well, we've had a few folks ask to see the slides. So why don't we run through yeah. those briefly just to show folks the breeds that we use here at Brooklyn Tweed. And then, yeah, I definitely want to get into, because it's it's a thing that's so big for us too, de designing the yarn for the specific breed and then designing patterns from that specific yarn. And you've, yeah. you've yeah. got, some patterns that you've designed with our yarns and with your yarns that I definitely want people to see. And we all want to see them too. So, yes. so but let me pop our little slideshow up here. So yeah, so from the, from the very beginning of Brooklyn Tweed, uh, we released our first yarn in 2010 and uh, Jared Flood, our creative director and founder, 
wanted to find out what kinds of breeds of sheep were available in the US and what kinds of yarns he could make out of them. So he, he did some research, tried, and he got into to fiber in a very similar way. He was a photographer and a painter, um, but has, had always knitted. Um, his mom is a fantastic knitter. Um, she comes by our offices a lot. Um, and he, he kind of fell down that same fiber, fiber rabbit hole that the, the rest of us did. Um, the more he worked with fiber, the more he wanted to know about it. Um, and so that led to, to the exploration of wanting to, to see how a yarn was made from start to finish. And could you design your own yarn and make it? And turns out 11 years later, the answer is yes. Uh, but here's just a few, here are the breeds that we use uh, Brooklyn Tweed for our yarns. Uh, the first one is Targi Columbia, which we source from Wyoming. Here are some Targi Columbia folks. Uh, this is a fine wool breed that was developed in Wyoming from crosses of Targi and Columbia sheep, which we'll talk about also. And we use this for our first three yarns, Shelter, Loft, and Quarry. Um, Jared thought that this had the perfect combination of the fine wool softness and elasticity from the Targi sheep with a little bit of structure and substance from the Columbia medium wool sheep that really just, for him, it was the perfect wool. So we, we built our first three yarns around this. They're all woolen spun for folks who are spinners. We'll be familiar with that. Um, for folks who are less familiar, that's where the wool is carded into sort of a, an airy jumble of fibers that are going every which way and then spun so that you trap a lot of air in the fiber as you spin, which makes a very warm and fluffy yarn, which we like very much. So that's what we used for our first three yarns. Then we wanted to start branching out because we, we love fiber. We wanted to see what else we could use. So our next yarn, next fiber that we got into was Targi, one of the parents of our Targi Columbia, uh, which we source from Montana and South Dakota. Uh, this is a fine wool breed. They were uh, developed by the U.S. Department of Agriculture in the 1920s to be a great fine wool sheep that would do well on the western ranges. Um, it's very soft, springy, resilient fiber. Um, it's We spun this, uh, worsted spun, into our Arbor yarn, our three-ply DK weight yarn, and knitting with it is so great because it's got so much spring in it that it just like bounces along on your needles as you knit. It's wonderful to knit with. So we, we really enjoy working with Targi. Um, also, we have got Columbia, the other parent of our Targi Columbia sheep. And we source these from Wyoming. Uh, this is a new breed for us. We uh, have used it for the first time in our yarn tones, which we released last month. Uh, this is a medium wool breed. So we really were really interested to see what this was going to feel like when, when, we, when we got the yarn in for the first time. Uh, this is also the first breed that was developed uh, by the USDA um, from long wool and fine wool crosses. Um, so it's got, it's got a nice substance to it. It's like a, a chewy bread. It's just got some, some good, good substance to, as you knit, but it's also very soft. I was surprised. I'm wearing my tone sweater today in Columbia wool. Um, and it's lovely and soft, but it's just got such a nice body to it as well. Um, and other folks on the team, we've, we've all been knitting with tones a lot. So we're, we're, we're all very up on our Columbia wool right now. So we'll, we can hear from other folks on the team of their experience of what the fiber is like. Um, but yeah, just, just really good. Just really good to it, which we like. Also, that's a technical term. Mm. We have got Merino, which we have sourced from Colorado, Nevada, and Utah. 
And the Merino sheep here are from Julie Hansmeyer's flock from the Campbell Hansmeyer Ranch. Uh, she is an amazing woman rancher. We worked with her to produce our Ranch O3 yarn earlier this year. Um, we've got some wonderful interviews with her on our YouTube channel and on our website and some great footage of her sheep. Uh, she's been working with Merinos for about 30 years and she probably has the finest flock of Merino in the country. It's, we were so honored and privileged to be able to work with her wool to create a yarn. That was a lot of fun for us. Uh, Merino has been called the king of sheep. It's, an, it's a very old breed. Uh, it was developed in 12th century Spain, probably even earlier than that. Um, and Spain kept a lockdown on Merino for 500 years. They were the only ones that were, could breed them. They didn't let them out of the country. They would sell you their wool because they were making mad money on it because everybody wanted it. And the, the name Merino has become sort of a generic synonym for fine white wool. Um, we have a little uh, post on our website talking about big M Merino, the breed versus small M Merino, the generic term. Uh, but it is its own breed of sheep. Um, it's known for very fine, very soft, very springy fiber. Um, it's very lustrous and velvety. It takes dye beautifully. And we've used this for three of our yarns. Uh, so we have Dapple, our wool cotton yarn. We combined merino and organic cotton to make this beautiful, soft, lovely DK weight yarn. Uh, we have used it for Peary, our worsted spun fingering weight. It's so springy and the dye just glows on the merino. And as I mentioned, we worked with Julie Hansmeyer with her Merino to produce Ranch 03, uh, which was a lovely sport weight five ply that we produced, mm -hmm. um, also worsted spun. And last but not least, we have Rambouillet, uh, which we have sourced from California, from Colorado and Wyoming. Um, and the sheep here are from another one of our ranch yarns, Rancho 2. We worked with Jim Forbes at Forbes Ranch in Casey, Wyoming. And these are his Rambouillets, as is this handsome fellow here. This is one of his award-winning rams. He has a very elegant nose. I like this guy. Uh, and we, we don't have any uh, Rambouillet yarns in production currently, uh, but we have used it for four yarns. Um, Plains was a single batch lace weight that we produced with Mountain Meadow Mill in Wyoming back in 2016, 2017, one of those years. Um, we used uh, we worked with Lania Still from Bear Ranch in California to produce Rancho One, Jim Forbes at Forbes Ranch in Wyoming for Rancho Two, and we um, did a second lace weight Rambouillet Veil, um, which we have recently retired from production. Um, not a whole lot of people were knitting with lace weight, so we uh, wanted to make space in the warehouse to make some new yarns. So we we. Put that on hold for now, but I suspect you will be seeing more Rambouillet yarns from us in the future because we love it. It's so soft. Um, it's basically the French Merino. So as I said, Sp Spain had a lock on the Merino breed for 500 years. And then finally in the 1780s, one of the Louis, the 16th, I think, might have been the 15th, get those guys mixed up, finally talked the King of Spain into letting him have a few Merinos. Uh, so France finally got some Merino sheep after 500 years. Uh, then the sheep, the Merinos got to France, promptly started the French Revolution in 1789, renamed themselves Rambouillet, and then emigrated to the U.S. in the 1870s. Part of that story is true. Uh, but they are lovely, lovely fine wool, soft, springy, gorgeous wool. So we will want to work with them again. Uh, so just as a quick recap, these are the 
five breeds of sheep that we have worked with and our yarns that we've created with them. Uh, one of the challenges that we have at Brooklyn Tweed is when we want to produce a yarn, uh, we are somewhat constrained by quantity. Um, because we do all of our production um, in the US, we're working with you know, two scouring facilities, um, a few mills, a couple of dye houses, um, and they all have minimum quantities that we have to produce wool at. So that means if we want to make a new yarn and we wanna use a new breed of sheep, we have to make sure that we can get enough of it to make the yarn. Um, so that's been a challenge because we're always like, oh, we want to work with this or we want to work with that, but we can't find enough of it or we're not going to be able to make enough yarn. Because um, we're, we're, we're in this kind of middle ground as a yarn company where we're too big to work with um, some of the small producers where we could go and get, you know, a couple hundred pounds of wool spun up, but it would be prohibitively expensive and we're too little to be big and we can just go to any you know, wool producer and be like, yes, we want you to make this yarn for us and we're gonna make thousands and thousands of pounds of it. Um, so yes, we're, we're limited to the breeds that we can work with. Our um, production director, Stephanie is here, hanging out in the chat with us. Um, so if anyone has more questions about you know, kind of finding, finding wool. She is, she is the woman. Um, but I will turn off our screen share here so we can go back to looking at each other. And there are, let's see, who are these guys? These are, I think these are Julie Hansmeyer's Merinos again, if I am correct. So those are, those are the breeds that we use for our yarns. Well, it, it, and Kel, it's a real treat for me to see uh, the next step up from all these different breeds. And I remember when I was at the American Sheep Industry Association meeting uh, in New Orleans uh, with Luigi uh, and Julie Hansmeyer and others, these are the ranchers from the West and these are the big flocks and these are the breeds that they knew about. And so their reaction to the display was very much what yours is to realize there are all these other genetic streams into sheep that are, that are possible. I also smiled when you mentioned Arbor because I just came back from a, a four day workshop with my friend Beth Brown Rensel in Vermont where we were studying Latvian mitting, mittens and here's the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the swatch that I knit uh, that would be uh, using Latvian techniques, but using Arbor uh, as a yarn. And uh, the techniques are wonderful. And the Latvians, I think, have never had the pleasure of working with Arbor, which is just so scrumptious and wonderful in, in, in that fiber. So uh, it's, it's fun to take your current yarns back generations uh, in traditional, traditional knits and, and finding their niche. So. Yeah, and so uh, you know, as a, as a as a designer of patterns, uh, it's obviously the texture of a yarn uh, speaks uh, to one of the important aspects of a design. A, hat, a project that I've been lately working on is simply a simple hat, but the design parameter I wanted, I wanted to knit a hat uh, that was very springy and cushioned that will fit a lot of different head sizes because oftentimes we're knitting a hat for a person, we don't really know the size of their head, but we want it to fit. And so that was the big design parameter. Uh, and I also wanted it to have uh, some easy cables. These are in fact, are not even cables, they're just twisted stitches. And so uh, I know that this, we, we want this to be uh, soft. So I just started with a Merino yarn uh, and actually it has the squish factor, uh, but I also realized that the slightly speckled uh, tended to de-emphasize uh, the cables, which are a main event. And for me, uh, each project should have just one main event uh, going for it. And this, it really is about the cables and the stretchiness. And so this got the stretch factor, but it wasn't so good in terms of showing the cables. Uh, I then uh, did some in Targi, uh, uh, which actually have all the, the, the right uh, 
stretch and softness and squishiness. Uh, and it didn't have the distraction of the speckles in the yarn, but I realized I wanted to work probably with a little lighter color that would actually show uh, the, uh, uh, the, the cabling uh, on that and, and so forth. And uh, then I also found uh, uh, some yarns that incorporate Coriadale, uh, which is a real uh, a favorite yarn of mine uh, in that it, it's actually a, a, a medium uh, weight yarn and uh, a, a medium wool, uh, and, uh, but still quite soft and really springy. And one of the qualities which I really liked about it was that when you wet block it, it really just blooms beautifully. And so even though it looks fine when you're doing it, once you wet block this, this, uh, this uh, fiber, it really pops into shape and the cables held beautifully. So that was great. Uh, another one, which turned out to be a little too dark, but was a very interesting yarn. Uh, this one is 25% Falkland Coriadale, uh, but it's also 25% Gotland. Uh, and if you've ever uh, had the pleasure of working with Gotland sheep, I know from the breed display, it's one of the breeds that catches most attention uh, because it has this lovely silvery gray fogers uh, uh, touch to it. It's really silky and it's simply sumptuous and beautiful. And again, this is that breed that's on the island of Gotland on the east coast of of, uh, of Sweden. And so while the color on this trip proved a little dark in terms of seeing the cables, the feel of this hat combines the plushness of Coriadale along with the silkiness of, which helps in, in taking the dye uh, with Gotland. Uh, then another uh, yarn which uses 100% uh, Coriadale, uh, 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 really uh, it was catching my attention. So here's one in lavender and here's one uh, that's, uh, that is in uh, sort of an olive green. Uh, and then you folks at Brooklyn Tweed made me break my rule because this now, I, I, uh, I, I tried the tones yarn. Uh, and while the main event on this is the cables and the stretchiness, I've also added two colors. Uh, and I think it works, you know, it's, it's, you know, I think it's good to have rules, uh, and, but, but you should know when to break them. And so this one, which surprised me for a woolen spun yarn, uh, the cables hold uh, beautifully. It may be good that they're just twisted stitches, but I did that one. And I also did one in the two tones of the, of the red and, uh, uh, it really came out just beautifully. And here's a little trick I've learned, which I'll share with you all, as you might want to know. You know, this is just simple one run ribbing, but we're going to fold uh, on a fold line. And I simply, right in the middle of this, I went down a size in the needles for three rounds uh, on this. And it just sort of naturally folds on that line. Uh, and it seems to be working, but it doesn't, it isn't really obvious. So that's just a little trick I've learned with this pattern. Very clever. So when is this pattern going to be coming out, John? We are, we are eager to cast on. <laughs> oh my goodness. This is a fun project I have with my two nieces, Becky and Meredith and my nephew, Peter, all knitters and we share fiber interest. So we've developed a little collaborative called Crane Wool Studio. And we design patterns, and and uh, and uh, so this one's probably going to come out this winter. Uh, once I stop knitting thing, because you know I've got so many. They made some in Rancho Three, and uh, all of that. So, uh, but I've also in, uh, uh, issued an early version because my friend Peg uh, Peggy Allen, who has with her husband Todd, has the world's finest uh, flock of Coriadale sheep in White River, Vermont. And, uh, and Peggy, uh, in order to produce wool as fine as the fleeces she produces, recently opened the Junction Fiber Mill in White River, she's making her own yarn. Oh, and so wow. we've, taken, we've taken a version of this hat and done it exclusively in, in, in Peggy's yarn, uh, and it just pops. Uh, and she's now selling that as kits. It's, it's actually up on Ravelry as a, as, a, as a pattern, but it's a prelude to the others uh, which will be issued this winter. There's going to be a, a, 
a uh, DK and light worsted weight version called Concord. And there's going to be a fingering sport weight uh, called Kirby. And those patterns will come up. But the early version where we, we, we worked out the uh, uh, details uh, were for Peggy, whom I think is on tonight. So shout out to Peggy Allen, who's created this wonderful fiber and is now spinning wonderful, wonderful mills. But it's, uh, so it's, it's, it's been real, really fun. Uh, my nieces and nephew, that's kind of a family project. Uh, it, we're, we're, we're not a, you know, a, a big concern. So that, uh, that's a wonderful example for me and why it, why it takes me so long to develop a pattern because I love to try different uh, wools to see what the fabric is going to be and encourage folks to play around with that. And it's really neat because uh, yarn manufacturers are now noticeably more often listing the breed of sheep that's in the, in the, uh, in the fabrics. I'm noticing, for example, you can now see some Texel that's getting worked into, uh, into yarns uh, and so forth. And uh, so, uh, yeah, that's, that's the project. And if we have time, uh, Kel, I can quickly show the, the same kind of process that I've done with some sweater designs, if, that, if you think we have time to do that. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. Um, We've got um, eight minutes left. So yes. Terrific. terrific. Anyway, I think it showed you earlier the sweater that my, my uh, great aunt Yvonne had knit for me when I was in college and it turned out to be a Gansey. And uh, that, <laughs> that was really, I didn't know it was a prelude. Uh, to what I was doing because uh, uh, back just a few years ago, again, my friend Beth Ram Rensel was finishing her book on Gansey sweaters uh, and she had uh, one more design to go and she was running off to teach in New Zealand for 10 weeks and she was going to have to design a sweater and knit it while she was on that. I said, Beth, no, no, no. I will knit the sweater for you, but you have to send me the pattern, which she did in pieces. And so I knit for 10 hours a day for five and a half, eight hours a day for five and a half weeks uh, and knit the snakes and ladders Gansey, uh, which in retrospect resembles so much the, the sweater that my great aunt knit for me. Uh, but this was, uh, you know, this was uh, knit in a wonderful uh, five ply Gansey yarn that, is in, that, that was Coopworth. Coopworth is one of the wonderful long wools so it doesn't have a lot of crimp, but it's wonderfully uh, long fibers. They're strong, uh, they're, they're rugged, and, and they're tolerably soft. But it, these Gansies are, are a working sweater. Uh, and this one is going to last for several generations. And so this was really the start with Gansies. And so uh, with that uh, experience, I wanted to design my own. And so I've worked out many, many swatches and, and using a, uh, uh, using uh, frangipani, which is a classic Gansey five ply yarn. And we don't know what, I don't, I haven't been able to find out what breed this is. It's simply listed as British wool. And of course the, you know, the Gansies came from Britain. Uh, but this one, uh, this one is knit uh, on US zero and double zero needles. So you can imagine how incredibly uh, strong and durable uh, this this fiber is uh, with these with these, this wonderful British wool and again this is going to keep out the wind the wow. wind and wet uh, but you see it's still a work in progress uh, uh, because I got intrigued by uh, some of the Brooklyn tweed yarns that were out and I said well you know we could make a Sunday go to meeting Gansey using uh, using Piri, you know, which is the merino that you have. So it's a very soft yarn. This is not the yarn that a, that a fisherman would want to wear in the North Sea, uh, but my goodness, it would be comfortable and has all the fine detail of these wonderful Gansey yarns. Uh, but I also realized uh, people, not a lot of people are gonna to want to, uh, uh, knit Gansies on such small needles. This was knit on US 2s and 1.5s, uh, which takes a while. So I also then upped it to, uh, to Arbor, you know, which is a, a DK weight yarn and doing essentially the same sweater and US 5s and 6s. 
And so it has a lot of the same feel of the fabric, uh, but it doesn't have the fine finish of, of, the, of the Piri. Uh, and again, this, this is still underway. So you can see there's still an arm to be finished on that. So that's really kind of the progress that, uh, uh, that I've been making as you work through a pattern and finding the right role for the right wool and the right weight of yarn on these, on these things. And uh, if this pattern ever gets out, that may be in a couple of years. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So I know I'm, we all want to knit it. And, well, and that's uh, such a perfect illustration of uh, like working with the wool to, and finding its, its right application in the right yarn and then figuring out right. how that's going to work best in a, in a pattern. Right. Yeah. Lovely. Right. Thank you for sharing those. Those are gorgeous. And I, I admire your hand strength for, for knitting frangipani at a, at a true Gansey gauge, because that is some, some serious knitting. It, it, it really is. And I think, uh, uh, but as, as, as I know, for so many of us, uh, uh, knitting is, is really a, a thoughtful meditative exercise. And, uh, uh, I think some people are able to listen to music or books on tape or podcasts. Uh, and I find that for me, it's just the engagement with the wool and the meditation. And uh, 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 I think, you know, that perhaps is the difference between a, a, a process knitter, which I am, uh, versus a product knitter who's excited about turning out the, 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 the projects and, and the gifts. And, you know, those are all fine as well, but for those of us as process knitters, uh, it's a real treat and, and willing to knit uh, kind of a number of samples to see where we really want to go. The little orange one uh, actually is from Ranch 03. It is for our granddaughter, Lily, who really likes orange. <laughs> and, uh, and I saw that fiber in the, that white merino gives you these, these blasts of colors, which is, is, is such a neat new direction for Brooklyn Tweed going. And I said, uh, Lily's not watching, so I can show you this, but this will be her surprise this fall. <laughs> Excellent. Yes, good. <clears throat> Let's see, uh, Lauren has a question. Uh, sh she wonders why you knit the entire piece as an experiment rather than swatching. <laughs> oh, I, I do swatch. I just didn't show the swatches. I think for the, uh, for the uh, Gansey in, uh, uh, in Piri, uh, I probably knit 10 swatches that were about 10 inches by 10 inches. Uh, the big thing for this was finding the right uh, proportion for the design element. That is to, to see how the flags uh, uh, meet uh, the cables. Uh, and this is a pattern that was often used, uh, was associated with Whitby, which is on the east coast of England up near Scotland. Uh, as many of you may know, uh, the different patterns are often associated with different villages. And so I wanted to adapt it to this to this particular sweater, and I love particularly how you know on these uh, these Gansies you get to do these wonderful underarm gussets. Uh, oh, that's that, gorgeous! Uh, so that uh, it actually it's you know it's a reasonably tight fitting sweater, but you actually can move in them quite nicely because you've got these these gusseted things. And the other the other nod to modernity. Uh, on the original Gansey, they would be the same front and back. And as they wear, you could switch them back and forth. It's a little uncomfortable. So I actually make, the, I put a few short rows in the back so that it comes down and doesn't pull up on the back. But otherwise it's a pretty straight Gansey. But yes, swatching is uh, for me a real pleasure. And, and as I said, for this, I need about 10 swatches probably. Excellent. So, and then, and then the whole garment <laughs> actually, I should should say, you know, I may, I'm I'm lucky. I'm retired uh, from from work outside the home, and so I have time to do this. And uh, uh, and a, a friend told me as I was retiring, you know, retirement is the Friday night of life. Uh, and with with the, with the fiber and the knitting, uh, it's been a wonderful Friday night. Excellent. Well, this uh, has been a wonderful Thursday night. 
and we are yes. at time. So thank you so much for being here with us, John, and we hope to see you again, either virtually or definitely in person as soon as possible. Uh, and thank you everyone for sharing your evening oh, with yeah. us. And yes, feel free to, to reach out to us. If you have questions for, for John, send us an email and we can forward them along. Yeah. Uh, and we will we will see everyone again soon. Thank you so much, John. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Be well, everyone. Be well. Stay well. Yeah.